This is part two of the Don't Lock Off Like a Meathead mini series, and today we are going to go over how intermediate climbers can level up their lock offs. In this episode, we'll continue to dive deep into the mechanics of a good lock off by taking a very intentional approach with how we think about the direction we apply force. These are concepts that I think a lot of intermediate climbers sometimes do intuitively, since they can be easy to stumble upon in a case by case basis. But I think consistency with these and the concepts from the beginner lock off videos are big signs of mastery when it comes comes to lock offs. So some background on applying force. Some of you may already know the 90 degree rule. It's more of a beginner concept that tells you to pull in, in a direction perpendicular to how it hold faces. This is to ensure that as you pull, you pull into the part of the hold that will have the best leverage. The major drawback of this approach is that it presents holds from a 2D perspective. But a core part of harder climbing is being in situations where a 2D perspective alone won't be sufficient. One way that pulling direction can become more complex than just the 90 degree rule is the concept of what I like to call compound forces. Compound forces is all about how climbing is inherently 3D, so therefore pulling directions will also be 3D. For example, there is a move called the deep lock-off, which is when the body position makes it so the lock-off position is closer to your center of gravity, usually due to high feet and low hands. In intermediate and advanced level climbs, it's common to have a deep lock-off followed by a reaching move straight above. Generally, you'll need to combine the isometric portion of the lock-off the part where you're holding as you reach, with some other move like a dead point or pulling on a hold to get higher. Regardless, keeping tension is vital in these cases, and we'll go over how considering compound forces will help you do that. Let's start by looking at a sufficient but not optimal way to do a move. You can see that I do get to the next hold, and in this scenario I am only using the 90 degree rule by pulling straight down. As I pull through to the next hold, you can see that I have trouble maintaining this lock off portion since the incline makes it difficult to hold. Let's now see what happens when I use compound forces to execute the move. You can see that this time my upper body stayed closer to the wall. There's significantly less distance between my body and the wall and the comparison makes it obvious that my upper body drifted away from the wall in that prior example. There are two things I did to achieve this motion. Firstly, I did a motion more similar to rows to keep my body close to the wall. Rows are an exercise where you pull back with your upper body and this rowing motion is almost more useful than pulling straight down for intermediate climbing. Because even outside of this example, it's very common for climbers to require that you pull out from the wall to get your upper body close. Even though I grip the hold in this 90 degree fashion, I am also applying force in a 3D manner by pulling back on the hold. The second thing I did will be discussed a bit later in this video, so stay tuned. Gaston lockoffs. Here's another example of compound forces at play. This climb has a Gaston lockoff that you use to transition your weight rightwards before getting another Gaston lockoff to fit a high left foot in. The crimps have a bite, so it makes it possible to apply a compound force here. By pulling outwards on the lockoff, we make it so we can fight how the body drifts out from the wall. The takeaway, learn to use compound forces to apply your force in a direction that keeps your body from falling away from the wall. Now, as a short climber, these transitions are not as difficult for me, but I think that taller climbers will definitely find it necessary to incorporate this 3D motion when having to navigate tight boxes in difficult lock-off positions in order to fight how your hips are being pulled out of the wall. The next concept I'd like to discuss is force transitions. This also enhances the 90 degree rule because it explains how the concept of leverage for a hold can change as we go about climbing, since our body can constantly move relative to the hold. Let's go back to the deep lock-off example so we can discuss that second thing I did to make this movement more efficient. Earlier, we mentioned how compound forces through pulling back on the hold can help to keep my body from drifting from the wall as much. In the case of a deep lock-off or even dead points that arise from similar positions, it's common for us to go from being under it to being on top of the hold. As our body goes from pulling from underneath the hold to being over the hold, we should then push down on the hold as if we were trying to mantle it. This will make it so that we are exerting force onto the hold for a longer period period of time. This is sometimes referred to as an overpull motion. Here's what the move looks like when I compare the move with and without this overpull motion. Individually, these motions can help the lock off. The overpull lengthens how long you apply the force on the hold, while the row from the compound forces section delays the time it takes before your body falls from the wall. But together, they made it 
it so that I could keep my body close to the wall the entire time. Another fun example of forced transitions can be seen from this outdoor boulder in Bishop called Acid Wash Right. There's a part of this climb that appears in both the V9 sit and the V7 jug start, where you lock off the left hand crimp and then hold the lock off for a few moves, one of which is this dead point around the bulge. The dead point around the bulge will carry your center of gravity out of the cave, and since the feet are slick, it can take a lot of tension to stay on. A common mistake that I and many other climbers I've seen struggle with in this part of the climb is not coming off the hold if you grip the left hand incorrectly. There's a section of the crimp that feels really deep and in cut, but it's also slopey. The way the dead point around the bulge pulls your center of gravity out of the cave ends up being too much for the in cut portion of this hold. So maintaining tension if you grip the hold this way would be incredibly difficult since both the crimp and the feet are so slick. This is why it's common to see people grip the hold this way instead. The hold is shaped like a triangle, so if you go farther left then you'll end up crimping such that your front two fingers are in the in cut slopey section, but the back two are pulling inwards on the left edge of the triangle. This means that as you do the first moves with the lock off, you still have the front two fingers in the in cut slopey portion, but once you transition to the dead point around the bulge, you can use the back two fingers to compress. This lets you create opposition with the dead point, and this compression can help you to keep from swinging off the feet. This is a great intermediate example of force transitions, because by just moving my hand slightly left, I was able to use different parts of the hold to achieve different pulling angles just at different points in the climb. Lockoffs definitely require strength, but hopefully this video has shown you the mechanical aspects that intermediate climbers can start to leverage while they build up that strength. We covered a lot of techniques in this one, so don't worry if it takes a lot of practice. As with most climbing techniques, the best thing you can do from here on out is to practice the concepts on as many different climbs as possible. Speaking of practice, if you want to learn how climbers are missing out on a load of technical learning, then check out this video which goes over how you can use a part of your warm-up so you can learn moves that will help you send harder.